Well, a terrible thing did happen in Dallas on November the 22nd, 1963. And in doing your research for this book, you became all but convinced that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Yeah. What persuaded you of that? The gun. Mostly it's the gun. It's, uh, if you, you know, there was that, uh, d deep throat in, uh, the Watergate, um, book and movie told, uh, uh, Woodward and Bernstein, follow the money. It turned out uh, to be Mark Felt. Yeah, it turned out to be Mark Felt. In terms of, uh, the, the assassination of President Kennedy, it's a case of follow the gun. Uh, it was Oswald who ordered the gun, mail ordered the gun from Chicago. It was Oswald who picked the gun up at the post office in Dallas. It was Oswald who was photographed with that gun by his wife in the backyard. Uh, with the pistol that he used to kill Officer Tippett in his belt. He had the gun in one hand, the daily worker in the other. It was Oswald who used the gun to take a shot at Edwin Walker, and it was Oswald who hid the gun in the Texas Book Depository and then killed J.D. Tippett with a gun, so, uh, w with his pistol, so, which was also a, a mail order gun. So you follow the gun, and it's Occam's razor that says 99 times out of 100, the simplest explanation is the true explanation. Um, one of the things about going on this tour, we were talking about fear, you know. One of the things that I, I, I'm afraid of, you know the guy in the State of the Union address that Obama uh, gave that jumped up and said, you lie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think no, I, I'm afraid Carolina. that the conspiracy people will be up there saying, you lie. Oswald was a clone. He was, you know, teleported to Earth by the Martians and then taken away. <laughs> but, you know, the fact is, Marina Oswald was convinced enough that her husband had been replaced by a double that the crafty Russians, you know, had put in place, that the body was exhumed, and they did the DNA, and yes, it was, it was Oswald. But, you know, there's a quote at the beginning of the book, um, from Norman Mailer to the effect of if the most powerful man in the world could be killed in the midst of his legions and his security, uh, then the world we live in is absurd. And I think a lot of the conspiracy theory theorists uh, are reacting directly to that idea that it must have been a conspiracy because it's too horrible to think that uh, the, the person that William Manchester called the wretched waif could just do this and change the course of history. But if, I'm I'm 98 percent sure. Jake in the book says I'm 98 percent sure that it's Oswald, and I'm about oh 95. He says, but I'm 98 percent sure. <laughs> yes, Norman Mailer did say it was unassimilable uh, such a thing. Uh, if it were true, then the universe is absurd. Uh, and yet in the novel, I guess it's Jake, who also becomes George when he goes back mm -hmm. to 1958 in Dallas, uh, who says that coincidences are rare. Uh, and in fact, there is a great machine whose fabulous gears are turning. Mm -hmm. That's fate, I suppose. Which is your own personal view? The absurdity of the universe or the intelligent design of the universe? Well, it's, I'm an agnostic on the subject. I don't know which way it goes, but it does seem to me as though there are forces that determine, let's say, 95 to 98 percent of our lives, and the rest of it is, is wild. Uh, I heard a story um, just before I came on this tour that I immediately related to what happened on that day. There was a guy somewhere in the South who won a million dollars on a scratch ticket. And, you know, the human interest thing, the, the press comes along and some TV station in Arkansas or something said, well, we want to recreate this, you know, for a human interest story on the news. So they took him out to the convenience store where he bought the scratch ticket. You know where the story's going, don't you? <laughs> they set up the cameras and the same clerk sells him the same kind of ticket and he scratches it and he says, holy shit! <laughs> and the producers immediately like, cut, cut, cut. You can't say that. You can say, uh, gosh, or something like that. He said, you don't understand. I just won a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> right? And for, for Oswald to have done what he did, and this is another reason that the conspiracy theorists choke on Oswald, you have to accept the fact that he got the job at the depository before Kennedy even knew he was coming to Dallas. He knew that he was going to tour the South and he needed to shore up his support. But it's just like there are a number of happenstances that 
make it very, very improbable that it happened just the way it, it did. The night before, uh, Oswald and his wife were really separated at that point. And uh, Marina Oswald was living with a woman named Ruth Payne in uh, Irving, Texas. And uh, Oswald had uh, a two-year-old daughter named June, and they, uh, she was pregnant with their second child. And she had the kid. Uh, Oswald didn't want to go to the hospital. He didn't want to take her to the hospital because he was afraid they'd try to make him pay. Uh, he was a little shit, basically, um, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, I tried to humanize him in the book, and it, everybody deserves that because he was a human being, and he did have his good side. It was small, a small good side, but a good side. But his habit was to come to the pain house on the weekends and uh, spend the weekend with Marina and his children, and then he would go back. But on the day before the assassination, which was a Thursday, he came a day early. And uh, partially, I think, it was to get the gun, but I think also to a large extent, it was because he still hadn't made up his mind, even at that last point, at that late point. So that that night, he and Marina uh, were in bed together, uh, and uh, they had no sexual relations or anything like that. But what um, Lee said was, is there, another, is there a chance? Could we try again? And she said no, and she turned her back. And the next morning when he got up, he took off his wedding ring, and put it in a teacup and took all the money that he had in his pockets and he put that in the teacup and he left. And again, you, you have to wonder what would have happened if she had said, uh, yes, Lee, we'll try one more time. So a number of different events led up to that and it makes it tough to believe. But on the other hand, nobody who wins the lottery, if you win a big prize on the lottery and you call people up on the phone, the first thing they say is, you're lying. That can't happen to you. Well, but somebody wins the lottery every day.